It's said that Kepler didn't age well. Although in 2012 and 2013 its architecture was cutting edge, their legacy in the 2020s was fondly remembered only among the hardcore budget gamers and in the occasional meme. Reflecting on Kepler's failures, many will point to its comparative lack of frame buffer compared to the competition. As time wears on, VRAM has proven to be a point of contention, and in this area it seems the GTX 600 and 700 series cards were not forward thinking enough, for the most part. I was originally going to review the GTX 772GB a few months ago. I even wrote a script in which my intro was about how sometimes it's the night before an assignment's due and you didn't have enough time to write a new essay so you just resubmit the one you wrote last year but with a few words changed. You see, the GTX 770 was a GTX 680 with higher clock speeds and improved power delivery. And while this strategy of refreshing old high-end parts into new mid-range ones would prove to be a sound one, the 2GB frame buffer would prove to be a limiting factor later on. What I have here though is something of a rarity. A handful of models of 770 were made available with 4GB of VRAM for a premium price. The relative scarcity of these models is presumably because sticking to cheaper 2GB versions was sound economic practice for gamers in 2013, and those with deeper pockets were probably looking at the GTX 780 or the Titan. Now though is the era of the scalper pandemic. If you can find one of these 4GB cards in 2021, its price should by rights have been negatively affected by its soon to be terminated driver support and its incomplete DirectX 12 compatibility. I picked mine up for £85, a price which puts it into the same territory as a used RX 460 and a new GT 1030, two relatively easy to find cards which have modern API compatibility but less VRAM and, at least on paper, substantially lower performance. How does the GTX 770 stand up in 2021 and does the extra VRAM actually help? I am once again whipping out my reasonably priced gaming PC to find out. Starting off strong, Apex Legends not only managed a healthy 60fps average at 1080, it managed to do so with textures turned up to high. This is substantially better than the GTX 670, though still a way short of the 780 series. Out of curiosity I did a run at 720 and saw averages leap into the 90s, though I couldn't see what the hell I was shooting at most of the time. Battlefield style World War II shooter enlisteds average and low frame rates almost match those in Apex Legends, averaging just shy of 60 FPS and dropping only as far as 40 at 1080 medium. Again, for visibility reasons, I prefer not to play at 720, but the option's there for those looking for a higher frame rate experience. If you happen to see any of my previous Kepler series videos, you might be aware that this series of cards is currently enduring a weird shadow glitch in Call of Duty Warzone, and as of the beginning of July this has yet to be resolved, so you might want to rethink getting one of these cards to play this game on. Performance wise, the GTX 770 doesn't beat the 670 by more than a couple of frames, though the larger frame buffer in this particular model means I'm seeing fewer texture and asset streaming issues than I did with that card. I'd expect the regular 2GB model of the 770, as well as the old GTX 680 it's based on, to have these same issues however. Playing Fortnite in competitive settings again isn't a big jump in performance over the 670, with averages of 118 being only a single point above those of the 670. Minimums were significantly higher, though server lag means it's impossible to determine how much of this is down to the GPU and how much is related to just pure luck. I decided to give high settings a try, and I'm afraid the 46 FPS averages and lows in the 20s weren't a particularly good experience. 
I was actually having a pretty good game, and if gameplay had been a bit smoother, I might not have gone out like a punk. Forza Horizon 4 falls, as you'd expect, right between the GTX 670 and 780 at 1080 medium. This card's averages of 53 FPS are almost 20% higher than the 670 and over 15% slower than the 780. This is reasonably playable, though most of the slowdown occurs when there are a lot of cars on screen at the beginning of the race. Depending on your own tolerance for stuttering, you may prefer to try 720 instead of 1080. If you are looking for a high refresh experience in Rocket League on Kepler, I have good news and bad news. The good news is the 770 averages 144 FPS at 1080 quality settings, which is about 10% faster than the GTX 670. The bad news is this generation of cards tops out at 120 Hz over DisplayPort, so at least at 1080 you won't actually see a benefit in this card over the 670. Cyberpunk 2077 is a demanding game on any generation of cards, and it's always impressive to see old hardware put in a good showing. At 720 with the lowest settings, the GTX 770 manages almost 40 FPS with dips into the mid 20s. If you just can't wait for your RTX card to arrive, there are worse ways to explore Night City. Running this card at 1080 is sadly one of them. Averages stick to the mid 20s and lows are in the teens. Benchmarking Valheim sometimes takes longer than other games. In this instance it's because I decided I really wanted to build a house on the beach, and then ended up fighting a boss afterwards. Uh, anyway, whatever work the team has been doing seems to have worked pretty well, and we're not seeing the appalling performance of six months ago. The GTX 770 manages averages of about 60 FPS at 1080 medium, pushing settings to high and turning on a few of the fancier effects cuts that almost in half. Well, uh, this is a pleasant surprise. The 2GB GTX 670 was an absolute disaster in Doom Eternal, but the 4GB 770 does comparatively well. 720 low settings brings an average of 69, no comment, and lows of 44. 1080 low averages in the mid 40s and drops into the 30s, so this is still pretty far below the performance of AMD cards of the same era. Given the actual GPU power of the 770 is only a little above that of the 670, I presume a lot of this performance boost is due to the added VRAM, so I have to assume owners of the 2GB version won't get this kind of experience. Before I talk about Horizon Zero Dawn's performance, I do have to mention the bugs. Kepler cars exhibit weird graphical glitches in this title, looking almost like you're running an unstable overclock. This is unavoidable, but it kind of blends into the background once you get used to it, at least during gameplay. Performance isn't too bad, and certainly beats the AMD scores I recorded earlier in the year, with 720 at original settings scoring 50 FPS average and 1080 dropping to 35. However, this is barely any improvement at all over the GTX 670. While this 4GB model is definitely the version of the GTX 770 to get in 2021, like the rest of the Kepler cards, this is something of a cursed monkey's paw for gamers. You get good performance, sure, however DX12 games like Assassin's Creed Valhalla won't even start. Some games like Doom Eternal just don't play well with Kepler. Others, like Horizon Zero Dawn, give better results than you might expect from some of its competitors, but what with the plethora of visual bugs that may never be fixed, there are plenty of caveats before taking the plunge on this one. Thanks for watching, kindly do the usual YouTube things if you feel so inclined, and I'll see you next time.